Last year uh, at finishing the task, we celebrated a huge milestone, which was the adoption for the engagement of every tribe. And we got down to zero. We've been working on this for 19 years. And we got to zero so that every tribe had been adopted. Now we have to move to FTT, finishing the task 2.0, which is mobilization for all of those Bible body of Christ believer in those tribes and everywhere else. So what happened last year was not the end. What happened last year was the end of the beginning. It was the end of the beginning. FTT, finish the task 1.0, was to get every tribe adopted by some group. In finishing the task, there are about 400 major churches and organizations and agencies and mission boards that have done the bulk of the work in getting uh, full-time Christian workers on the field uh, for a minimum of uh, three years in these different tribes. Altogether, about 1,600 different agencies uh, from around the world have taken a part of this FTT uh, goal. 1,600, this is a very big coalition. They all can't come together every year in a conference because they're literally spread out all around the world. But finishing the task is a coalition of about 1,600 different agencies, organizations, churches that have said, let's finish the task. The great commandment and the great commission. So we're happy and we're thrilled and we celebrated the, uh, the fact that each of those tribes had now been adopted and actually uh, we have been deployed for engagement in most of those cases. There's still a few left that need to be uh, deployed. But now we've got to move to FTT, finishing the task 2.0, which is uh, mobilization. It's interesting to me that in 33 AD, there were only about 120 believers. When Jesus resurrected, they're in the upper room, and they're meeting and he says, don't do anything till I send my spirit. So he's got less than a couple hundred believers right after the resurrection. And within 300 years, it dominates the Roman Empire. Even Caesar has become a Christian. And it becomes the official religion uh, of the Roman Empire. Now that's amazing because up till about 313, Christianity was pretty much illegal in the Roman Empire. And if you became a Christian, you were more than likely to be either crucified or thrown to lions in a Colosseum or you know, persecuted in some way, fed to lions. The most rapid growth of the church was the first 300 years of the church. And the two common denominators that they had during the first 300 years of the church was intense persecution and no church buildings. There were no church buildings for the first 300 years of the church. They met in homes uh, in Jerusalem that says they met in the temple co courts and from house to house. I have been in the oldest still standing church in Malula, Syria, which is now riddled with bullets due to the civil war. Uh, but that church building was built in about uh, 312. There weren't any church buildings for the first 300 years of the church. The most rapid expansion of the church did not require buildings. So what made the gospel and what made the early church grow so fast? Well, fortunately, we have the book of Acts. And, and it tells us how they mobilized Acts from Acts chapter two, which is the birth of the church, obviously on the day of Pentecost, uh, un until uh, up to about 20 years later when Paul returns to Jerusalem and they say in Acts 20, uh, Brother Paul, notice how many myriades, is the Greek word, myriades 
of believers there are now in Jerusalem. Uh, that literally means tens of thousands of thousands. If I had time to take you through the book of Acts and show you how they go from 3,000 on the first day of the church to then 5,000 men to 15,000 and on and on and on. Uh, most Bible scholars estimate that within 20 years, the church at Jerusalem had about 100 to 125,000 members in Jerusalem. You say, well, how big was Jerusalem? It was about 250,000. So half the city had become believers. That's why when the Sanhedrin say to Peter and the apostles, you have turned this city upside down and you filled all Jerusalem with your doctrine, they weren't kidding. Half the city had come to Christ. What made that growth so fast? How did the gospel spread so rapidly from 100 or so people to the dominant religion of the Roman Empire in 300 years? In a word, mobilization, mobilization. And the seeds of mobilization, everything that needed was needed to be done in the next 300 years, God modeled in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. Some of you know the story of my father. My dad was a pastor for 50 years. Never pastored a church more than about 100 people. But he was a carpenter and he was a good builder. And in his lifetime, my father built over 150 church buildings all around the world, all around the world, every continent, Latin America and Asia and Australia and the islands and Middle East and Iraq and Russia and all, all over the place. Um, when he died a few years back, uh, he was dying of cancer. And uh, on the last few days, we brought him home for hospice in my sister's house. And the last week of my life, I listened to my dad. He was in a dreamlike state, but kind of semi-awake and not, but he was dreaming aloud the entire last week of his life. You can learn a lot about a guy by listening to his dreams. And it's interesting, my dad never talked about being a hero in World War II, or he never talked about um, movies he saw, books he read, not in his dreams. But for a week, I listened to my dad redream building churches all around the world, taking volunteers and building churches. It was interesting because right before he died, he'd come to me and he'd said, son, I think I got one more church in me. His lungs were already half filled with water and he's dying of cancer. I said, dad, if you wanna die with your boots on, that's fine with me. Mom's already gone. Uh, you're not the kind of guy to sit in an easy chair and watch a golf show. Uh, so if you wanna die on the field, that, that's okay. I said, where is the last church you wanna build? He said, Siberia. <laughs> One of the last pictures I have of my dad is in the dead of winter in Siberia, snow everywhere on the top of a roof of a little church, nailing the roof down in the snow. I thought, that's my dad. But he dreamed about this project and that project and make sure you get that lumber over there and make sure the volunteers get back for lunch and, fix that joist together and make sure it's wired, make sure the electricity's off when you're wiring it and, and on and on and on. And the night before he died, I was in the room at my sister's house with my niece, Alyssa, and uh, my wife, Kay. Then all of a sudden, my dad became very agitated. He'd lost a ton of weight, very, very thin, kind of like Gandhi looked in his last days, very, very skin and bones. And he started trying to get out of bed. And my wife, Kay, said, Jimmy, whatever you need, uh, just tell us, we'll get it for you. You don't need to get out of bed. But he kept trying to get out of bed, trying to get out of bed. And, and she said, Jimmy, um, whatever you need, we'll get it for you. Don't try to get out of bed. What, what do you need? And he kept trying to get out of bed. And finally, my wife got a little stern with him and said, Jimmy, you're dying. You cannot get out of bed. Whatever you need. We'll get it for you. What do you want? My dad said, gotta save one more for Jesus. 
Got to reach one more for Jesus. One more for Jesus. One more for Jesus. Got to reach one more for Jesus. Save one more for Jesus. I'm not exaggerating. I had two other witnesses in the room that over the next hour, my dad said this maybe 150 times. One more for Jesus. Reach one more for Jesus. Got to save one more for Jesus. I'm sitting by my father's bed. Tears are flowing down my face. And I'm thanking God for a legacy of a dad who in his final words is still talking about the souls of others. The souls of others. And I bowed my head and I am sobbing, sitting next to his hospital bed. And my dad reached up his frail hand, and it was shaking like this, and he put it on my head as if a blessing. And he says, reach one more for Jesus. One more for Jesus. Save one more for Jesus. I intend for that to be the theme of the rest of my life. I invite you to make it the theme of your life. If you know something more important than bring people to Christ, build them up to maturity, equip them for their ministry and send them out on their mission. If you know something more important to do, I invite you to stand up and tell us. Because I decided a long time ago as a very young man, I'm not gonna waste my life. And I haven't. I have invested in it what matters most. One more for Jesus. I wanna close with a prayer for you, but before we pray, I want you to listen to this song. A woman in our church wrote a song about this story, and then I'll close. As I looked in my father's eyes, set by his bed and held his hand, and I said my last goodbye, he just held on for as long as he can. And I heard him say, reach one more for Jesus. And I heard him 
in the next 365 days. 176,000 people in my state, California, 176,000 people will die in the next 365 days. Most of them will go into a Christless eternity with no hope. In the next 365 days in my country, America, 2.4 million people will die. And most of them will go into a Christless eternity with no hope. In the next 365 days, 74 million people will die in the world. And most of them will go into eternity without Christ. The good news is only good news if it gets there in time. We have to speed everything up. Faster church planting, faster evangelism, faster Bible translation. It's not good news if I die before I get it. Those statistics keep me awake at night. And I will say to you what I said when we started. If you want God's blessing on your life, you want God's anointing on your life, you want God's power in your life, you have to care about what he cares about most. He wants his lost children found. He's given us a model in Acts chapter two for mobilization. It's time for finishing the task 2.0. The tribes have been adopted, but now we have to mobilize for a Bible, a believer, and a body of Christ within everybody's distance that they can get to. Everybody needs to know somebody who's a Christian. Everybody needs to have access to scripture. Everybody needs to have a church that they can get to. I know I'm preaching to the choir. It's not like you need convincing. You wouldn't be here if you weren't already bought into this. That's why I love you so much. But we're not enough to get it done. You have to be an ambassador. You have to spread it to everybody else. We have to mobilize millions and tens of millions of people for a Bible, a believer, and a body of Christ for everybody. I want to close by praying for you. I'm going to kneel here at the front. If any of you would like to come and kneel here, uh, I would invite you to come to do that. If you can't get up and kneel, that's okay. It's not like it's more spiritual. But if you want to come and join me in prayer as we recommit ourselves to finishing the task. This is a holy moment. God is here and you know it. So let's pray together. I'm I'm going to pray a prayer. I'd, I'd like to lead you in a prayer together that we all pray together aloud. And then after this prayer, I wanna pray a blessing on your ministry. I wanna pray a blessing on your life, your family. And we'll close with that. But I I think it's just good for us to reaffirm our commitment on on at least an annual basis to say, God, we're, we're in on what you're doing in the world. So I invite you to pray this prayer aloud with other brothers and sisters who we're all making this commitment together. I'm making it. I'm renewing my commitment. So just say, dear Father, I want you to use me anytime, any way, anywhere, anyhow. Use me by your grace. I put my faith in your grace. And I'm asking you to use me for the global glory of God. I am available to you and I am yours. 
Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your calling in my life. I accept my calling. And I want to be what you made me to be. And I want to serve your purpose in my generation. I want to be a part of finishing the task. Use us together for your namesake. Father, I want to thank you for these men and women who are praying this prayer right now. And we're just signing up again. We're saying we're all in. Nothing matters more than your kingdom. Thank you for the privilege of making our lives count, of investing our lives in something that's gonna outlast us. We need revival in the world. Let it begin in our hearts. Let us go to 2.0 so that there is a Bible and a believer and a body of Christ within distance of everybody on this planet. Make it happen. Father, take what little we've got and multiply it. Use us for Jesus' sake, for your glory and the growth of your kingdom. Father, I want to thank you for your grace. I thank you, you know, every stupid mistake I'll make and you still chose me. And I thank you that you know the mistakes that every one of us will make and you still chose each of us. We did not call you, you called us that we would go forth and bear fruit. So we're asking for fruit. Lord, do what you wanna do in our lives. Don't hold back blessing from your people and your world because of us. Thank you that you use imperfect people. If you only lose, use perfect people, nothing would get done. Thank you that you use us in spite of ourselves. Even with mixed motivations, you still love us. And so today we're asking for the privilege of seeing in our lifetime a Bible in every translation needed. Believers in every language, tribe, nation, and people. And a body of Christ within walking distance of everybody in the world that you could do what you want to do. We're just saying we're available, we're on your side, we're, we're signing up again. We're reaffirming the commitments that we've made long ago. Help us to pray for each other. May we be more effective together in this coalition than we would ever be by ourselves. May we would encourage each other we're not here to compete, we're here to complement, to collaborate, to cooperate. And we pray, Lord, that you will use us to speed up the task of Bibles, believers, and bodies of Christ all around the world. Multiply our number, we pray. Bring revival for your name's sake for your glory. Now, Father, I pray a blessing on every person here who's praying from the sincerity of their heart. I first ask you to bless their health. Give them good health so they don't have to worry about their health as they're serving you. Give them new energy. Give them new vigor, new vitality so that we can be more effective for your name. Don't just protect their health, give them better health than they have right now. I ask that you protect and bless their families, spouses, kids, grandkids, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. We know that Satan can attack us through attacking our families in so many different ways. Put them under your hedge of protection. Protect our spouses and all that we love so that we can focus on you and your kingdom and your growth. 
I ask that you bless their finances. I ask that you bless their finances so they don't have to worry about bills, that that's not even something they think about, that they can focus on you. I ask you to give financial support to every ministry here. May 2020 be the most effective, the most blessed, and the best supported year of ministry. Lord, we know this is your will. We know your will is the great commandment and the great commission. Help us to put those five verbs of the great commandment and great commission into our own lives, to worship you, to fellowship with you and with others, to grow in you, to serve you, to share you with others. I ask you to protect the minds of every person here Satan throws darts of discouragement, darts of depression, darts of doubt, uh, darts of conflict, darts of fear. Lord, help us to remember we don't have to believe everything we tell ourselves. That what is true is you. May we spend more time in your word than we do anything else that we know your word because it is the truth that sets us free. Help us to incorporate and practice these eight truths from your word in the first church. On the first day, you gave us the model. Holy Spirit, we are telling you, we can't do it without you. You said without me, you cannot bear fruit. Not that we'll have little fruit, that we can't bear any fruit. So we're asking you, Holy Spirit, to fill us, cleanse us, break us, mold us and make us, fill us with yourself. Bring glory to Jesus through our bodies. I pray for my deaf brothers and sisters who are here. I pray for their outreach to 70 million deaf and over 430 million with hearing uh, disabilities. Help us take the gospel to those who can't hear, to those who can't see, to those who are in places that they've never heard your name. We're just asking you to please, please, please use us in ways that would astound the world. Make your name great through ordinary people. I pray this blessing in Jesus' name, amen.